So, we have been getting loads of questions. <laughs> So, uh, a lot of them focused on the history of science, some specifically on Newton, some on math. And I know, I think Steve would like to also talk about the, the God of the gaps, but could we start maybe with some of the, the um, philosophy, uh, the history um, of science questions? So, maybe we can just dispose of these quickly. What impact did the resurgence of Neoplatonism in Renaissance Europe have upon the rise of science? Was it a major catalyst, minor catalyst, or impediment? Probably a bit of uh, an impediment, though there's a lot to say in favor of Neoplatonism philosophically, but it would have, uh, Pla Platonism, Plato even more than, much more than Aristotle was less interested in the empirical world and more in the world of the forms. So I would, I, I, um, uh, let's leave it there. I think okay. it's a complicated question, but I would say probably it's a bit of an impediment. Okay, and then someone else asked, does a relationship exist between the Reformation and the subsequent scientific revolution? If so, can you briefly explain? Right, I think, I think here, I'm very ecumenical. Um, developments in late medieval Catholic philosophy, uh, especially at the universities of Oxford and Paris, had a big role in laying the foundations for a number of the uh, in, uh, the, the systematic methods of investigation, figures like Robert Grosstest, uh, Roger Bacon, um, they developed methods that very similar to our isolation of variables. Okay. And, uh, but the Reformation too played a big role in emphasizing the fallibility of man and the contingency of nature on the will of God. That's the, what's sometimes called the tradition of theological voluntarism. And that was a big break with the Greek way of thinking, as I mentioned, the Necessarian theology that kind of got intermingled with some uh, medieval theology. So uh, both parts of the Christian faith tradition, I think had, a, had, a, had, a, had, a, uh, had an important role in the rise of modern science. Um. Speaking of contingency, uh, someone asked, you said that... Uh, also, on the, to be fully ecumenical, on the, on the Reformation side, part of what was recovered was the emphasis on the Bible and the Old Testament, in particular the Hebrew Bible, and a lot of the concepts about the laws of nature came out of uh, books like the Book of Job, where there was an idea of, of, of boundaries that God had set on nature, that God was order, actively ordering nature. So uh, part of what the Reformation recovered was the Jewish background. Okay. Uh, speaking of the idea of contingency and voluntarism, someone asked, you said that a pope advanced the argument about contingency. Which pope was it? Um, I was blanking on his name, oh, 1277. Okay. It's Etienne something. Uh, so it's in my book, okay, uh, chapter go, one. Go yeah. get the book. That's good. <laughs> there um, a subtle and, advertisement, yeah. And then um, maybe to round out the questions on the, on the history of science, uh, well, actually, there are two more things. Uh, someone actually asked you about the Galileo f affair and its impact, and um, what's the most effective way to summarize how the Galileo affair is relevant or not to the it, supposed conflict of uh, science? Mike, Michael Keyes has done great work on this. Owen Gingrich has done great work on this, uh, historians of science. Uh, effectively, it was a debate about uh, Aristotelian philosophy, not so much Christian theology. The idea that the earth was at the center and the orbits were circular was a... Was a uh, uh, a, a Greek concept from Aristotle and Ptolemy. The church had adopted it, probably in an ill-advised way, and it became entwined with Christian orthodoxy. And so when Copernicus came along and Galileo came along and challenged that, uh, some viewed it as a challenge to Christian theology, but it was really a challenge to uh, uh, a, a syncretism of Greek thought with, with Christian theology and the empirical methods of the new scientists ultimately won out and disentangled the two. So I don't think it was ultimately a, a, a fight about um, uh, between science and, and Christian theology as much as it was a fight about the new science versus the old science of Aristotle. Um, also, Galileo was somewhat imprudent in um, making fun of the Pope in a famous dialogue that he wrote in which the words of the Pope were put into the mouth of a character called Simplicio, which was not the smartest thing he could have done. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. Okay, to round out these questions specifically on history of science that actually brings things to today and actually probably connects to your book, um, someone asked, philosophy can be argued to have its roots in ancient Greece and the diversity of thought was enabled enabled by the flexibility of its pagan ideology. Philosophy matured 
past its roots in Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, etc. What do you say to the argument that science has now matured past its Christian origins? Uh, I say read Return of the God Hypothesis. <laughs> uh, the, uh, that, that's right on point for the book. As the, the book tells a big story. It's the rise of modern science during the period of the scientific revolution as the result of or in consequence of these Judeo-Christian presuppositions that are in the minds of the early scientists. We lose that perspective in the late 19th century with the rise of figures like Darwin, Marx, Freud, Heckel, um, and many, many others. Scientific materialism becomes the dominant worldview that's associated with or attached to science. I think the major discoveries of 20th century science, especially about biological and cosmological origins, are bringing back that theistic perspective. And if not, if they're not bringing it back, they, they should be bringing it back. That's the argument of the book, that, that the evidence we now have of the, uh, concerning the origin of the universe and the origin of life, the fine tuning of the universe, these three big discoveries, I think, have profoundly theistic implications. So I don't think theism is in any way irrelevant to the scientific project. Uh, instead, I think a theistic view provides the best overall explanation of the, uh, the big facts we have about biological and cosmological origins. So science is, again, I think, pointing to God. And the theistic presuppositions that made science possible are still implicit in everything we do in science. Great. Nature is intelligible. It is ordered. And that order is contingent. Great. We have a couple of people who are interested in mathematics. I'm going to sort of combine their questions. Uh, did God create a universal language, and is that language mathematics? And then someone else added on, is math primary or just a confirmation to natural processes? Mm. These are all fantastic questions. Yeah. I think many of the, the great scientists have seen that the natural world is written, if you will, in a language of mathematics, that math, it's, it's really quite mysterious. Uh, there was a great article by Eugene Wigner, a uh, Nobel laureate, Hungarian physicist, called The Unreasonable Applicability of Mathematics to the Physical World. Why is it that mathematics that we sometimes invent as we're thinking theoretically, mathematically, hundreds of years earlier later applicable to describing actual physical processes. It's very eerie and it suggests that same principle of correspondence, that there's, a, there's, an, intellect, there, there's a, an intelligibility to nature that is revealed in mathematics that also seems to reveal a great mind behind nature written in the language of mathematics. So yeah, I would answer, simple answer. The first question is yes, I, I, I'm inclined to that view. Second question was... Uh, um. Really, is, is math um, primary or just a confirmation to natural processes? I think sort of. Well, I, I think most of the great physicists would say it's primary, that when you get to the thing that really helps us understand the order or perceive the order, it's expressed mathematically. That there is, that, so that we see order in nature, but the order can be described precisely with mathematical equations, oftentimes differential equations. And it's quite extraordinary. It suggests ma math in our experience comes out of minds. It is stored in minds. It's used by minds. And at the foundation of reality, we have this profoundly mental or intellectual feature uh, in, the, in the, the physical world conforms to mathematical patterns. So I think it's, it's very fundamental to our understanding of nature and is therefore primary in that sense. So we had quite a few people who were intrigued by the last part of your talk, and so here are a few questions from that. Can you comment on the ether and dark matter and dark energy? Um, <laughs> ether, <laughs> I see Bill Dembski out there. I'm, maybe, see if he can help out. Um, okay, uh, the ether was always a theoretical construct. It was never observable or directly detectable. Uh, with special relativity, the Michelson-Morley experiments, uh, we, fin we finally once and, for, once and for good got rid of it. Um, and um, we do now have unobservable matter that's posited in cosmology called dark matter. Um, and it's um, posited as a way of explaining things that we can see. And I think this is a common thing in, in physics. So there's nothing inherently wrong with positing an unobservable entity to explain something observable. It's just that the ether turned out to not be very good at explaining what we actually see. 
So physics is often indirectly inferential in that we posit unobservable entities insofar as they help us to explain things that we can observe or measure or detect, which I think is an interesting point about the God hypothesis in that there's no intrinsic disreputability. There's nothing intrinsically disreputable about positing a past action of an intelligent agent or of a designing agent or even of God if in so positing we can provide a more comprehensive and or parsimonious explanation of the observables. Um, dark matter is a physics, is, is posited on the basis of its ability to help us explain certain phenomena in cosmology. Um, and there's a cosmological model called the oscillating universe that depends upon, um, that, that has been refuted because there's not enough energy even the, uh, and dark matter, even the dark unobservable matter to cause a recollapse of the universe. Um, and any, anyway, there's a lot more to say about all of that. But yeah, that's a great question. Someone else asked, do you see any relationship between quantum fields and constant spirit action? Uh, well, the modern uh, view of gravity is that gravitons are a manifest, uh, if you go to the, the standard model of particle physics, the idea that el elementary particles are manifestations of underlying fields. And, but fields are oddly defined operationally in terms of what they do. So fields in physics, to me and to other philosophers of physics, uh, not all, but many, have a kind of occult quality. We don't know really what a gravitational field is other than it creates a warping of space. So it's the thing that causes the curvature of space. What is the curvature of space? Well, it's the thing that causes matter to move in a, a, a particular kind of curved trajectory. But what is curved space when space is empty? Um, well, that's a harder question to answer. It's, it's, it's all called in the sense that we define it in relation to what it does, okay? And which, which was the very thing that bothered Leibniz in, that seemed to him to be the return to the, the, proper, the, the, the explanatory strategy of the medievals. So physics has never really gotten away from these occult properties. And the particular question was about, oh yeah, in quantum field theory, there's a new theory called quantum gravity, which attempts to synthesize general relativity, which is sort of the, the second theory of gravity after Newton's, with fundamental quantum phenomena, because there are points for example, very early after the beginning of the universe, when the universe, when quantum effects would have predominated, so we need to have some account of how gravity would have worked in that domain or that period of time. So there's been this attempt to synthesize, and one of the idea, one of the um, theoretical constructs which produces, out of which comes the notion of gravitons, is the quantum gravitational, the concept of a quantum gravitational field, and. The weird thing about gravitons is that whether they are um, proposed as a result of quantum field theory or as a result of string theory, which was an attempt to shore up some mathematical problems with quantum field theory, gravitons are massless entities which transmit gravitational force, not, at, not instantaneously, but at the speed of light, and they transmit gravitational force by warping space-time. So you have a massless thing that warps a completely massless thing, and that explains how matter moves. It's still occult, that's okay. the... Okay, um, in our last five minutes, I'm gonna try to sandwich in three things, which one of which includes asking about um, the, the God of the Gaps. But we have someone who asked, I think, a question, maybe a little <laughs> bit more technical for some people, but I, we hear this a lot. Uh, methodological naturalism was developed by Christian scientists, so why? is methodical, methodological naturalism not the preferred method for Christians today? Um, I dispute the premise of that question. Um, it's a common view and I understand where it comes from. But um, in the Boyle, the mechanical philosophy is the first attempt to formulate where God is an appropriate and not appropriate explanation. And the charge against Newton is that he violated Boyle's rule, which is that we shouldn't be invoking episodic actions of the divinity to explain regular things that we observe as regular processes in nature. And it turns out that Newton didn't do that. It's a common, common story. I have a whole module on it that I knew I wasn't going to get time to do, but maybe next year. Um, it's in the book. It's in chapter 20. 
I've always been suspicious of this story because Newton's whole theological project was to show the principles of mathematics at work in nature. In other words, he, he was reveling in the grand regularities of nature as an expression of divine action. Why would he then invoke God's episodic action? He didn't believe in a capricious God, so why would he be invoking that? It never made sense. And yet you hear this story over and over again. Neil deGrasse Tyson told it in the Cosmos uh, reboot that he did on Fox. Um, it's, it's on the BioLogos website. It's in numerous historians of science. So in researching the book, I just went back and read the relevant parts of the Principia on this. And not only does Newton not make that argument that God or the angels step into, the, the, the claim is that the, the outer planets made the, the uh, you know, Jupiter's orbit was, was irregular and in that the, there was a need to, to t tweak things so that Newton said, well, every once in a while, God just jumps in and, 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 and somehow tweaks the planetary orbits. He did not say that. He said that the planetary orbits that, that were stable on an order of millions of years and that, this, and that everything was stable about the, the, the stable center of the sun. So he did not invoke... It's just, it's in, if you want to, the chapter and verse, it's in the Principia, book 12, um, chapter 12, theorem 12. It's in, and I've got, I've got a slide on it. It's in the book. It's a commonly told story. What Newton did believe was that God was the constant, he was constantly sustaining the universe by the word of his power. That in him, all things are held together. They, they, in him, they have their being and they are moved. So he believed that God, what we call the laws of nature, are a mode of divine action. But he didn't think God was acting willy-nilly to adjust things and fix things that he hadn't gotten right in the first place, which was Leibniz's argument against him. And then secondly, he also made initial condition fine-tuning arguments. He believed that the eye was initially and beautifully designed. To, and he made a, a beautiful design argument in the optics based upon the, the, the fact that the eye seemed to anticipate the properties of light. So he perceived in that a great mind behind the whole system. And in that argument from the general scholium about the, about the initial condition, fine-tuning of the planets, that's very similar to the modern kinds of design arguments. But this is not God acting to, in, a, in, in a capricious way to intervene in nature, which was what Boyle was against. So um, anyway, it's, a big, it's a, again a big story, but the, the prohibition against invoking divine action was invoking a particular kind of divine action that would have been a science stopper, that would have kept us from getting to an, uh, an understanding of the causal powers that God had built into nature. And that was the prohibition that came from Boyle. That was not methodological naturalism in its modern form, which says that you can't invoke divine action to explain anything, including the origin of the universe or its fine tuning or the origin of life, which are different classes of question, not classes about the nature of regularities and what underlies them, but rather classes about causal origins, what caused something in the first place. Boyle made those kinds of arguments and affirmed their legitimacy in their own domain. And in my work, I've made a distinction between historical science, which asks questions of ultimate or initial causal origins, versus um, the sciences of the, what, what the Greeks called nomological, the, the, the science of law-like regularities, or experimental science, which is concerned with law-like regularity. So in one category of science, invoking God prevents us from understanding the, the material interactions that, are, that underlie certain regularities. In another type of science, it may be absolutely necessary to get a true understanding of what caused things to come into being in the first place. I think that is a great place to wrap up, except we have one comment from someone uh, named Alex that I wanted to read as an ending, which is, return of the God hypothesis is the best and easiest to understand overview of science history I have ever read. Meyer does a great job making cosmology concepts easy. So if that's not an endorsement, and we didn't pay for it, and Dr. Meyer didn't know about it, uh, I, I don't know what I was afraid it was going to be a troll. <laughs> no, no. So what you should, we're going to break in just a, a moment, but as, as I give the final announcements, Dr. Meyer, you're going to pick up yourself and go out and get ready to sign books. Okay, very good. Thank you uh, very in much. In the Fellowship Hall. So.